what you heard is that the world of CMOS is ending, and is ending somewhere before 2025. 2025, if you believe uh, ITRS, uh, which says that uh, we shall have this perfect most low curve going on until 2025, and then all of a sudden everything stops, which is unlikely. So earlier, if you believe that, you know, you won't have this strange behavior. And, uh, uh, you know, you are all familiar with Moore's law. It says that uh, the feature size of, uh, of uh, transistors decrease uh, by a factor of two uh, every uh, three years. So it means that the density increases uh, by a factor of two every year and a half. Some of you may be familiar with Stein's law. Uh, if something cannot go forever, it will stop. And that's exactly what will happen with Moore's law. It cannot go forever. Therefore, it will stop. Uh, and uh, if you look at ITRS uh, predictions, they predict that in 2024, we have a feature size of 7.5 nanometer, which by my computation is around 30 atoms of silicon. So clearly, you are reaching to the limits uh, of what's feasible. You know, you get into a world where it's not anymore continuous phenomena, but discrete phenomena that are happening. So uh, uh, clearly, we won't be able to continue much longer. In fact, there are very good reasons why seven nanosecond, uh, nanometer may be the limit of what we can do uh, with uh, silicon, with CMOS, and I'm sure there are people here in the room that know much more than I on this area. In fact, as Mark in this area, in fact, as Mark Horowitz has said last uh, yesterday, uh, scaling has already ended. Uh, scaling, traditional scaling that I learned when I learned VLSI many years ago, was that you uh, decrease the feature side by by a factor of lambda. You decrease uh, the voltage by a factor of lambda. That increases the clock by a factor of lambda and uh, uh, power doesn't change at all when you do all that. So you get uh, lambda square more devices and that run lambda time faster, so lambda cube, without increasing power. And that has not been the case for, for I don't know, basically I think since we hit 130 nanometers, that's when uh, this stopped. And since uh, we have not uh, scaled in any conventional way, uh, some people say that what we have done, we have taken advantage of a sequence of small miracles. Uh, and if you look at the miracles that ITRS says uh, are needed, and by the way, you are right to say that they are optimistic that they draw the curves, but when you read the text, you see that actually they are quite pessimistic. And that's some quotes that I took from, uh, from the last ITRS. We will need new materials, we will need uh, semiconductors, nanowires, uh, carbon nanotubes, graphene, a lot of new materials. We will need three-dimensional architecture, which we already hear from Intel, uh, vertically stackable cell arrays, and so on. Uh, these are huge industry challenges to simply imagine and defi define. That doesn't look to me very optimistic. And miracles are expensive. Uh, again, uh, uh, that's a quote from, uh, uh, from the ITRS report. Uh, it will be very hard uh, to continue to uh, get more performance at uh, you know, a decreased cost. It will be hard to get the same cost to performance improvement we have seen in the, in the past. Direct quote from their text. And the reasons are obvious. You go to more materials, you go to more complex structure, uh, manufacturing cost increase, uh, you, need more, uh, you need more to go through more stages of manufacturing, you need to, to use uh, you know, uh, higher precision as your feature size decreases, you can tolerate less variance in your, uh, in your circuit. So there are many reasons that make uh, manufacturing uh, more expensive, uh, and there are many reasons that make uh, uh, FAPs more expensive. Uh, uh, I picked this number of seven billion from the 
a fairly recent announcement about Abu Dhabi getting into the silicon manufacturing uh, 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 industry technology, and they spoke of investing $7 billion uh, dollar, uh, a year. Uh, 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 rule of thumb that has been, that is uh, associated with ROC, which by the way is not a technologist, but, uh, but an investor in technology, is that FABs, the cost of a FAB is uh, doubling every four years, uh, and uh, uh, the inter revenue, last that I looked, is doubling only every six years. So there is a pro problem there at some point. Uh, you know, when the, what you have to invest in your FAB is an increasing fraction of, uh, of your revenue, of your uh, yearly revenue. So, uh, as Doug has said, uh, I certainly agree with he, him, uh, uh, economic reasons are going to slow down the evolution of technology before you get to the end of what is uh, technically feasible because it takes more and more money to, to turn the crank and you will need to amortize these investments over longer periods of time. Uh, you know, in a sense, if it costs twice as much to get a dancer, it is twice denser. That's the point where you stop, uh, you know, moving the technology and we may get to that point before we get to the limits of what CMOS can get us. That's another quote uh, from the ITRS report. In the long term, which long term for ITRS is 2017 to 2024, while power consumption is an uh, urgent challenge, its leakage or static component will become a major industry crisis threatening the survival of CMOS technology itself, just as bipolar technology was threatened and eventually disposed of decades ago. Uh, so power, we all know the problem is power, and power, you know, may end the evolution of CMOS technology. When I read that, I thought a little bit about my use and the nice supercomputers that you could see in the 70s, they were using freon cooling, uh, uh, liquid nitrogen cooling, you know, cryogenic cooling of uh, one kind or another, beautiful machines. And then we went to machines that actually are quite boring, like the SP I was involved at IBM, or the other machines that used, uh, uh, you know, uh, quartz, uh, custom of the shelf component, uh, no nice package. Uh, we are going back to very nice packages. This is Power 7, which is going to be in blue waters. Water cooled, very, uh, you know, I think this U2 uh, drawer is something like uh, uh, more than 100 kilograms uh, because it has a lot of copper and a lot of water for cooling. Very nice package, but that is in fact a very nice indication that we are getting to the end of the CMOS era, that cooling start again to be you know, major issue, and uh, next we shall have freon cooling back, and then we get to the end of this road. Uh, so, uh, do we have a technology that is waiting to replace uh, 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 CMOS the same way that um, offsets and MOS uh, replaced uh, bipolar uh, whenever? Uh, early 80s or something like mid 80s, depending where you are looking. Uh, now, several observations. One observation is that the replacement of a bipolar by NMOS was not, not that easy. In fact, a large part, you know, the big losses that IBM had in the early 80s were due to the fact that uh, they had a very costly transition of uh, mainframe computers from ECL to, to, to MOS. And uh, for a while, they were moving to computers that were less performing than uh, uh, ECL built computers, but were much cheaper. Uh, so any such transition is not an easy thing on an industry. Uh, the other point that is important to remember is that when uh, uh, MOS uh, replaced bipolar, MOS had been used in chip devices in Intel microprocessor for almost two decades. So it was not a new technology being developed, it was a technology that had been in use 
in manufacturing use, in product use, for 15 years or more. It was a perfect example of uh, what uh, uh, is being discussed, but Christensen discussed in the innovator di dilemma. A technology that was around was less good than the ECL technology, but was cheaper than the ECL technology. A technology that came from the, uh, from the bottom and slowly replaced the cheaper, more expensive and better technology until ECL could not continue and was totally replaced by uh, most, even in supercomputers. Today, uh, technologies that might replace CMOS are not in broad use, and none of them are cheaper than CMOS, so it's not anymore a technology coming from the bottom, it's maybe a technology coming from the top that we try to make cheaper. So it's a very different uh, uh, situation. Here is an example of a technology that exists, uh, Jacobson Jackson, uh, Junctions. Uh, it exists, it can be manufactured, well at least we can, we can do circuits, we don't know how to do memory. Uh, it can be uh, several orders of magnitude uh, faster than CMOS, it can be several orders of magnitude, uh, it can use several orders of magnitude less uh, power, less energy than CMOS but it requires uh, liquid nitrogen cooling, so you won't see it on your cell phone anytime soon. So, uh, to summarize what I just said, CMOS is going to plateau, and you know, I'm not an expert in, uh, in microelectronic. Mark can have uh, a better g a crystal ball than I have, but it's going to plateau and the perform at the performance that's between 10 times and 100 times the performance that we have now. Moore's co curve is going to flatten. It's certainly going to flatten in the coming years. Uh, we won't have a technology that is immediately available to replace uh, CMOS. Uh, so we shall have in my mind an increasing bifurcation between the commodity technologies that we speak a lot here what goes in cell phones, what goes in, uh, in laptops, what goes in mobile, and so on, and between the extreme performance microprocessor technology, what you will need if you want to build top supercomputers, exascale and beyond, what you will need if you want to build very powerful uh, embedded system, military systems of one kind or another, uh, we shall have very, you know, I think we shall see technology that is more powerful than CMOS, but it's not going to be valid or va uh, it's not going to be cheap enough for much of the mass market. So we shall see a bifurcation between the technology that goes into the mass market and technologies that you need, say, to build a top supercomputer. We won't be able to reuse commodity technology for devices that are extremely powerful. And that's what I mean by extreme computing. It's not only supercomputers, but any application where performance is really at premium. To the point that you are willing to pay much more than you pay on a commodity device. So, and again, the fact that Moore's slope stop is not the end of the, uh, of the computer industry. It's not even the end of the growth in the computer industry. We shall have a mass market that continue to use CMOS for many years, and we shall have ex what I call extreme computing. Uh, we heard about uh, uh, applications or directions that can drive the mass market. Honestly, I think that what will drive the mass market is fashion. You, know, you will buy a new device because it has the color of the year, and you will you know, continue changing your cell phone every year because it needs to have a new color or a new shape. Uh, extreme computing is where I want to focus. I am a supercomputer person. Uh, and we need to do two things there. We need to bridge the gap. Uh, uh, we need to use CMOS more efficiently. And we need to start preparing to use post-CMOS technology. So let's discuss compute efficiency for a while. Uh, you heard both from, uh, and by compute efficiency what I mean uh, is basically being able to do more computations out of a budget of energy, do more computation out of a budget of transistors. I look at that as a 
equivalent of fuel efficiency for cars, you try to continuously raise your fuel efficiency. In extreme computing, we should continuously try to raise our compute efficiency. And uh, one problem that we have, uh, when you speak of cars, is re relatively easy to understand where you waste uh, your energy. You know, you have friction, you, have, you want better aerodynamics, you want to reduce the weight, and so on. In computing, we don't have a clear definition of what is waste in the computation and what is not waste. You know, uh, we may say uh, the, the operations are what we care about, everything else is weight. Waste, but we know that we need communication to do any computation. So some communication is not waste; is inherent in the computation you do. What communication is inherent? What communication is waste? That we don't know really in most of the cases. So we need to develop a better understanding of what is fundamental, what energy consumption or transistor consumption is fundamental to the computation, and uh, uh, what is really waste. Uh, and basically what we need to focus, and that's nothing new that I say here, is on reducing communication. Because the energy is spent on communication. That's a table I picked from uh, a report that was written two years ago about uh, supercomputing by Kogi and other people. And uh, what you see if you look at the second column, uh, can I show it? Uh, no. But the second column is showing you how much uh, energy you spend uh, for bringing uh, uh, operand from L1 or from L2 or from memory or from a remote job, uh, uh, from a remote node. This is in a technology where doing one flop is 10 picojoules. And you see that getting an operand for L1 is already several times more expensive than doing a floating point operation, bringing it to memory is an order of magnitude more expensive. Bringing it from a remote location is two orders of magnitude more expensive. So it's clear, and that has been said by many already, that the problem is communication and to reduce power consumption you need to reduce communication. The problem uh, and that's the reason I picked the title of my talk, the reason why I think the research for exascale computing is important because we are already facing this problem in spades. Uh, um, the, there is a strong push to get to exascale uh, uh, soon. DOE has set a target of having an exascale machine that consumes 20 megawatt uh, in 2018. Uh, there are good reasons why we want an exascale. It's not, you know, uh, getting to the moon first, but uh, it's, there is real research and real engineering that needs this kind of performance. Uh, the main impediment to get to this level of performance is amount, the power consumption that such a machine uh, will have. And uh, it's clear in my mind that you don't get to an exascale machine incrementally from where we are today. So to get to exascale, we will need to do research on how we significantly improve the fuel efficiency, if you wish, of computers. Uh, in fact, uh, since I mentioned the Kogi report, uh, not all of you may be familiar with it. It came out, I think, in 2008. It's available on the web. It's interesting. Basically, what they studied is what would it take to build an exascale computer using technology that's going to be available in 2015. And their conclusion is that they could build a machine that will consume around 70 megawatt. But this is a machine that it's not clear is of any use. In particular, it would have only 3 petabyte, 3.7 petabyte of memory. Uh, we plan to have a machine that in the petascale range that will have one petabyte of memory. So the idea is here is to go three orders of magnitude uh, in performance while increasing memory size capacity only by a factor of three. Not clear that as a machine you can really use. It also would fail very frequently. They predicted 40 minutes between failures. So it's not clear that you can use it very well. And there are a lot of other limitations. 
That's also interesting. This was bare metal machine. You assume that you don't have caches, you don't have virtual memory, you have nothing of what makes a modern architecture. Recently, Peter Cog did, did a second uh, uh, cycle looking what happens if you want to have this kind of architecture but with a regular, regular mechanisms, L1, L2, L3, virtual memory, and so on. His current estimate is that it will consume more than 400 megawatt. So, um, you know, can we build machines that consume 400 megawatt? It starts being expensive. Uh, let me try to skip some uh, slides in the interest of time. You heard a lot of co-design, both from Doug uh, and from uh, Mark, uh, specialized architectures, which I will certainly agree is a very important direction. However, it's not, you know, for me, which is interested in high-performance computing, it's not terribly interesting because high-performance computing uh, is not very specialized. You look at any large application, it brings together many components that have different behaviors. Uh, what changes most rapidly in scientific codes is uh, compute-intensive kernels, uh, and people continuously change their methods, so it's very hard to customize to something to, to targets that continuously change. And uh, uh, whether you do a simulation of uh, one kilometer resolution or 100 meter resolution or 10 kilometer resolution, which may be the same algorithm, it could, but it can totally change the behavior that you see at the level of the architecture. So it's very hard, you know, high performance computing architectures, I believe, are not the uh, applications, I believe, are not the kind of applications where specialized uh, hardware will have a lot of play. So we, you will really need to think about general purpose methodology techniques for having more efficient computing. Since uh, uh, computer science here has a very good theoreticians, and now you work together with computer engineering, I would like to propose several challenges where I think uh, that some fundamental thinking is needed and some fundamental thinking is needed to tie with the engineering practice in this area. And I listed uh, a set of problems or issues, and I'm going to briefly go over that, but I suggest these are areas where research is important to pursue in order to build more efficient machines, and these are areas where even the fundamentals are not well understood and therefore it's not pure engineering, but it has to be really, you know, from the theory to the practice. So power complexity. We want to compute stuff while using less energy. Well, we don't have any real uh, theory of power complexity. You know, uh, the theoretical papers that look at how much energy you need to consume uh, to compute something tells you you don't need to consume any energy because you can have reversible computations, so the answer is we not, you know, why do we have, we need no energy, how come our machines consume that much? So uh, can we build some theories that fill this gap between the quantum uh, theoretical answer, you need no energy, and the practice, you know, we are more and more energy constrained. What is the theory of energy consumption for, com for computation that can, relevant, that is relevant to current engineering, we don't have such a theory. So theoreticians, please try to develop something. We know that the problem is communication, and I spoke of that and I showed that. Uh, yes, there is some theory that looks at communication complexity. So we know what's the communication complexity for an FFT, uh, n log n to n. Uh, we know what's the compl communication complexity for dense linear algebra, n cubed to, to n square, and that's all, basically. Uh, we don't know for any of the computations that really take major amounts of time on supercomputers, we have no idea how much communication is really needed or what's the trade-off, say, between communication and the rate of, conver rate of convergence or iterative solvers or any such answer. We don't have a good theory. So in particular, we don't know if the algorithms that we are using now are anywhere close to the best one can do 
uh, in order to reduce communication. To go beyond that, in many cases empirically, we know that we can reduce communication by doing more computation. But these are anecdotal results. I don't think there is any systematic theory that explain for interesting com computation problems what is the trade-off between communication and computation and how you can uh, replace one by another. Uh, let me skip that. Communication is not only bandwidth, you know, and how quickly you move data from one place to another. Communication can cost a different amount uh, according to whether it's unpredictable or it's predictable and you can plan for it. There's a difference if you wish between express mail, you pay much more because you didn't plan in a, ahead of time what you wanted to send and between regular mail. So uh, if you know ahead of time what's the communication pattern, uh, you can use technology that is cheaper. You don't need to switch uh, at each cycle uh, your uh, communication network. Uh, again, I don't know of any theory that distinguishes between algorithms that require communication to be uh, data dependent and algorithms where the communication is not in advance. Nor I know of any architectural work that take advantage of the fact that for most scientific computing applications, in fact, the communication pattern and the computation pattern is fairly predictable. You know, when uh, we don't, uh, you know, we don't, uh, we, we do iterative computations, we repeat the same pattern again and again, even if we do adaptive, uh, we use adaptive algorithms, we don't adapt, you know, at each cycle or at each, each iteration. There is a fair amount of, uh, uh, you know, of s the changes are slow, but again, there is no theory of what can, what inherently required fast adaptation, where adaptation can be slow, and there is no work in computer architecture or computer runtime that take advantage, computer architecture mostly, that take advantage of the fact that there is a lot of predictivity in computations that we are doing. In fact, computer architecture, I may know ahead of time everything that's going to happen in my, uh, in my computation, but uh, the architecture will continue to try to do branch prediction, even so I know that I'm going to branch after 5,000 iterations, and there is nothing to predict. I know exactly 4,999 iterations will go one way, uh, jumps will go, I mean branches will go one way, the 5,000 branch will go the other way, but the hardware is dumb. It doesn't have this information, so it continues to try to predict, which for scientific computing is very wasteful. Uh, jitter. Uh, jitter is a major problem for high-performance computing. The fact that not everyone uh, advances at the same speed so when you try to do a global synchronization, you are waiting for the slow, uh, slowest uh, process, slowest pro node. Uh, so you suffer not the average of the slowdown, but the maximum of the slowdowns, uh, which is a major problem. Uh, the way we have tried to uh, resolve jitter in high performance computing is by reducing it and assuming that jitter comes from uh, operating systems that do strange things under the cover, so you get an operating system that is very quiet, doesn't have demons, doesn't have interrupts, well done with jitter. But as hardware uh, evolves, we shall have more and more, uh, as hardware becomes more uh, fault prone, we shall have more and more jitter because of error correction in the hardware. Uh, even, you know, some say, Hardware will not have error correction too expensive. I don't want to think about that. Others say hardware is going to hard, uh, hide the errors, which is perfectly fine, but it means that hardware sometimes runs faster, sometimes runs more slowly because it's trying to hide the errors. So we will need to uh, uh, develop software that runs perfectly well, even if components of the system run at different speeds. And we're very far from that today. Let me perhaps go through one more of those. Uh, one reason that machines today are very inefficient is because we have various subsystems 
which incur at different points of time different loads. So we have to over-engineer each of the subsystems for the maximum loads, uh, a memory subsystem or LUs. Each subsystem is engineered for much more than the average because sometimes we have more load on our memory subsystem, sometimes we have more load on our FPUs, sometimes we have more load on our caches. Uh, the solutions that people are thinking in order to avoid this problem, and you heard it multiple times, we are going to have all these many subsystems, but we are going to uh, speed them up or slow them down or turn them off altogether when we don't need them. Uh, we are going to continuously adjust the power that each subsystem gets, hence its performance. The question that I would ask is why do we have this variance in the load of the different subsystem? Is it inherent? Or is it just that the way we are programming machines now is inefficient? Can we develop software that even out the load on the memory, on the, on the CPUs, so that we don't have this problem? And we do that implicitly in some places. We try to overlap communication and computation. That's a way of evening the load between the network and between the CPU. People in real time has thought on how to uh, hide the memory accesses that you need for the next task to overlap them with, uh, with the computation of the previous task. So try to overlap memory accesses with computation. These techniques exist, but we need, I think, to look at them uh, much more seriously. I have more, but you will be able to get them on my slides. So let me finish since I'm out of time. And I think, I hope I convinced you that the uh, Moore era is getting to its end and that it's going to bring fundamental shifts in the IT industry and in what is important CS research. One of the directions where CS research has to involve is to think much more systematically about efficient use of compute resources, efficient use of transistor budgets, efficient use of power budgets, which require a more systematic and rigorous studies of uh, sources of inefficiencies. You know, my joke is that uh, the big change that uh, uh, will happen with computer science is that it has to become a real engineering discipline. Uh, you have to understand things really in a, at a deep level. You cannot anymore you know, run after the next generation of uh, silicon. Uh, exascale at reasonable power may be the first move into this new era and therefore I am excited to participate in exascale research not only because we shall have the next big iron but because I think you are going, we are going when we research exascale, uh, we are going to uh, really change quite uh, significantly how we do uh, uh, research. Let me suggest that that may be an area of research, a broad area of research that would be quite appropriate for the new center you are establishing and a collaboration between computer science and computer engineering and uh, prepare for the revolution.